Real people downloading Metallica master songs. They want to sue everyone between the ages of, say, 13 and 30? I don't think so. I guess I would be lying if I said that I, I, I didn't have any or didn't fear, you know, going to jail. The music industry would be just the first of many to discover the web could destroy established business models. In 1999, Sean Fanning released a small piece of software on the web called Napster. He first had the idea for the software at college. I got paired up with a roommate who uh, loved obscure rap music, and it was, you know, around that time that I started envisioning an idea where people could install a piece of software that would let them share their music collections as well as access other people's uh, collections. Napster took advantage of the shift in music from CD to digital formats like MP3s that were easy to copy and swap. It allowed web users anywhere in the world to share music illegally with one another for free rather than buy it. The software pooled information about the music on every computer that linked to it. Users could search this giant database hunting for tracks. When they found what they were looking for, Napster hooked up the computer storing the file with the person who wanted it. At the click of a mouse, music piracy had gone global. The leveling, sharing dream of the web had produced a more sinister outcome, encouraging thousands of people to break the law for the very first time. The band Metallica became the music industry's unlikely mouthpiece. Their music is wild and anarchic, but to top band Metallica, it's serious business. When fans download it for free, Metallica gets angry. If you have the right to download my music for free, then let's say that you're a plumber or you're a car mechanic or whatever, then I have the right to call you up at any time and demand that you come over and fix my plumbing for free or that you come over and fix my car next time. It's not functioning for free. I never imagined that the the outset that Napster would change the music industry at the level that it did. But they certainly felt the pain of being forced into a world of digital distribution. After two years of legal battles, in 2001, Napster was restricted, then shut down. But other more sophisticated services simply took its place. Today in Britain, the entertainment industry claims 95% of music exchanged online is unpaid for and lost revenue from illegal downloads of films, software, TV and music is worth 531 million pounds. Our computer technology lets us copy everything instantly. It's very scary. It means a new world. A new world's ahead. And it may take decades. It may even take centuries before we actually get to the final ending point. So the web has threatened the way any traditional industry based on information and communication does business. But this dramatic shift involves more than just theft and piracy. It also is about a way in which the web appears to be staying true to its anti-authority, leveling ideals. The web's essential design, the ability to share information globally and instantly at virtually no cost, wrenched control from the traditional middlemen, the agents, the publishers, the newspaper editors, and allowed people to connect directly with one another so everyone could have an audience or a following. In this brave, new, connected world, you didn't have to be anybody to be a somebody. When the web first came, it felt like the whole new world was opening up because you had a way to be a publisher that you never had before. There were only very few discrete sources. Who are the publishers of the world? Oh, I can go here, and I can go there, and I can go there, and you were limited. Now someone with an iPhone can post a video, make a podcast, connect to someone else, Anyone with the means of communication um, through a computer can have access potentially to a vast audience. User-generated content is the jargon for this creative revolution. It's estimated a fifth of all the material on the web is now made up of content created by amateurs. All human and animal life is there. One of the biggest distributors is YouTube a website that allows anyone to put videos online. That means everybody has a chance to be seen. Um, I, th I think in the past, uh, again, the, the traditional models would survive around scarcity. Um, 
which I don't think necessarily is healthy for society, for ultimately a, a few people to have the control of the creation of all the content within the world and then have the control of all the distribution. YouTube posted its first video in 2005. Now the site is viewed more than a billion times a day and has created its own new stars. I always tell people we're the stage, um, they're the performers. But I don't look at us as, as, a, as a service that's trying to exploit that. What we're trying to do is just provide the opportunities uh, that didn't exist before. Superficially, sites like YouTube, with its promise of five minutes of badly shot fame, appear to be proof of the web's leveling power. But for many users, the web is less about old revolutionary ideals and more about a new way to work within the system. For people like Master Shorty, who was recently nominated for a MOBO award, it's the perfect promotional tool. Now you are promoting yourself, you're marketing yourself. Yeah. How has the internet made that possible in a way that you wouldn't have done before? Um, I think that it, that is what the internet is what made it possible. I use the web a lot um, from promoting my music to finding producers to actually make the music, and in terms of promoting and marketing, I think that's the main source of um, you know um, resource that I use. Yeah, but ADHD was one of the. Lovely, the internet's full of you know fabulous music lovers in general. So it's like a big community online with up and coming um, rappers, singers, musicians, producers. I'm I'm able to reach loads of people at one specific time quickly, like the drop of a hat. Looked at coldly, this user-generated, self-promoted world can seem less a challenge to established industries and more a kind of feeding ground, a way for new voices to be discovered and incorporated. You can shatter hierarchies, the hierarchies of the music business, for example. Uh, but in the end, once you become known, you have to sign up with one of the recording studios, uh, as in American Idol. The old hierarchies are still there, they're just scrambling to adapt themselves to this new situation. The web does make it easier to produce and to share, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's democratizing creativity. Examined closely again, something more intriguing, more disturbing even, begins to emerge. And it can be seen most clearly in the world of the blog. Once, blogging was the preserve of those who couldn't be heard any other way. Now it's gone mainstream. This shift tells us something critical about the cycle of revolution and counter-revolution working through the web today. I'm on my way to meet a key player in the new media. Arianna Huffington likes to think of herself as one of the biggest cheerleaders for the democratizing power of the web. Oh, I'm a huge optimist about the web. Uh, I, I think the way that it has um, provided a forum for millions of people who otherwise would have been locked out of the conversation is incredibly significant. But the reality of the website Ariana launched seems more about taming the web's millions of sprawling voices than embracing its democratic potential. The Huffington Post is what's known as an aggregation site. It collates and filters other people's work from across the web for free. And ironically, as it's become more influential, it increasingly resembles an old-fashioned newspaper. I feel that we are moving towards a hybrid future where we combine the best of traditional media, accuracy, fairness, and the best of new media, transparency, immediacy, accountability. But in this hybrid world, instead of everyone having an equal say, increasingly editors are filtering and excluding opinion. The hybrid future that I'm envisioning is going to include millions of voices but it's not going to eliminate editors. In fact, editors will be more important than ever. The web's pioneers hoped it would liberate millions of fresh new voices. Instead, people like Ariana Huffington are the new gatekeepers, 
re-establishing the old hierarchies.